welcome to Collider Movie Talk, Movie Talk for Movie Fans. I'm your host, Ashley Mova, and this is The Daily Show. We give you all the latest news from the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Leading off the show today, Christian Harloff. Nice to see everybody today. Welcome back to Movie Talk, and Arnold got chased by an elephant in South Africa. Also here, John Schnapp. I tried to do the Schwarzenegger impression, but then I'm not even going to. This man to. here is the one. You got to see his little video clip. Is it up? Oh, it's anywhere? on Schmoes, yeah. Check it out on Schmoes. It made me laugh. It made my day. We were trying to convince him to do it once a week. Just redo it once a week. <laughs> and as a second thing that we were talking about earlier, learn how to end your movies. <laughs> also here, Mark Ellis. Not, yeah, not we Christian, should. Not Christian. Not me. Yeah, separate. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, learn how to end that Arnold getting chased by an elephant bit. We really wanted a nice denouement to that 45-second yeah. bit. We just didn't get it. We need another one now. All right. What's up first? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I just realized something. <laughs> what's up? What's going on? <laughs> am, I, am I going? Yes. I'm going. Okay. Yes. A new set of rumors have hit the internet thanks to a report from Joe Blow. According to their sources, story elements from the popular comic series Planet Hulk will be adapted into Thor Ragnarok. While specifics are still unclear, the report mentions that the gladiator games of Planet Hulk will factor into the story with Thor somehow becoming involved with the games that will be overseen by Jeff Goldblum's character, the Grandmaster. Joe Blow's report goes on to state that the story will involve Thor tracking down the ultimate weapon to stop Ragnarok and reset the universe, with the outlet hinting the weapon to be another Infinity Stone needed for Thanos' Infinity Gauntlet. Thor Ragnarok will star Chris Hemsworth, Mark Ruffalo, Tom Hiddleston, Anthony Hopkins, Kate Blanchett, Eric Bana, Tessa Thompson, and Jeff Goldblum. Thor Ragnarok opens November 3rd, 2017. Christian, thoughts on a Planet Hulk storyline in Thor? Oh, thoughts I got to do first because I have so many times people always like to say, well, th those people are never right. I got to give props to El Miembe. Uh He brought this up like two and a half, three years ago that, that they were talking. They've been talking about the Planet Hulk storyline for a very long time. I buy it. I think I, mean, I know we're not buying or selling, but I, do, I believe that we're going to actually see elements from the Planet Hulk storyline. It makes the most sense. Yeah. It makes a lot of sense for them to do this. We've been talking about how he's going to be challenged a lot more in this different, you know, not being on Earth. So I absolutely think it's going to happen. I think it's been talked about more. And I think with the success of Guardians of the Galaxy, they made, it made it more realistic that they could do something like this. So, yeah, I, I think it's going to happen. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it, I mean, you look at Marvel's latest comic books over the last like ten years. You have Battle World. You have New Secret Wars. You have Planet Hulk. You have World War World War Hulk. You've got all these different uh, you know planets with superheroes thrown on them, and they've got to do battle. So I think this is the perfect way to bring in Thor with Ragnarok and make Hulk a larger part of the the film. The weirdest thing that I thought was like they're like, and Thor will have short hair. That's the weird, the little element what? when I was like, what? Yeah. Thor with short hair. But yeah, you know what? I'm really excited to see Planet Hulk in th a th a Thor Ragnarok. It's I mean, like it's when Metal could cut their hair. We know he, he's <laughs> Thor. He's got to have long hair, man. It doesn't make sense otherwise. This sounds awesome, but good luck explaining this premise to somebody who does not care about comic book right. movies. Like, no, so, okay, so you got Thor. <laughs> and so, so he has to go fight these games that's put up by the Grand Master. But then Thor, they got to get these Infinity Stones from Thanos. It's like, it's a little Clean bit harder. Your mouth. <laughs> Yeah. You know, all nerds yeah. don't talk yeah. like that, Mark Ellis. What, what happens, you need the ultimate weapon to stop Ragnarok. And it's it, it's it's harder to digest that for a non-comic book fan than it is, hey, you have these six superheroes and they have to get together to save New York. But I love this idea. Somebody who's never read Planet Hulk, it sounds like they're going to do the right mix of honoring the legacy of the comic book mm -hmm. with also putting in their own ideas to make it a great film. So I am totally on board with this. I just want to say I'm offended by your voice. I think it's just, you know, it's going to be an amalgamation of all, like just like Civil War wasn't Civil War and like from the mm -hmm. comics, it's the same thing. Like they'll be able to bring yeah. some of the better elements from Planet Hulk into it. I still, I mean, everything, if you, if you add this plus the idea of the, the buddy cop element, totally. uh, I think this is going to be, sounding and i think you said it last week being more and more a very anticipated film like i like because the last thor was i mean i remember liking when i saw the theater and then i watched it again it's just it's it's one of the weakest i think yeah. marvel films so Aww, the first one no the, the second, second one, one. Oh, the, second it, one. Yeah. the dark yeah, elf it, it's yeah so if you start if like because i did when i saw that movie the first time I, I think i convinced myself i liked it more than i did and then watched it again it doesn't hold up hang on hang um, on it's called the dark world i know you don't have to correct me because i said the dark elf I was talking about that no, i almost said right. into darkness uh, yeah. a bunch of nerds said, he said the dark elf you <laughs> don't have to correct me. I know First what it's called. Voice yeah, yes. now they're making fun of me. <laughs> All right, what's next? 
Force Awakens screenwriter Lawrence Kasdan was recently speaking at the Atlanta Jewish Film Festival about his prolific career when the conversation turned to his work on the next Star Wars story that will focus on a young Han Solo starring Hail Caesar actor Alden Ehrenreich. In doing so, he confirmed a start date for the upcoming spinoff saying, you know, Chris Miller and Phil Lord are going to direct it. They're great, <coughs> funny, and imaginative, and we've had a great time together. My son, John, and I wrote the script, and Chris and Phil are working on it, and they're about to move to London to start shooting in January, and it should be fun. Kazan and his son, John, are currently hard at work on the solo movie that will feature Han and his trusted companion, Chewbacca. Kazan continued speaking about his work with Lucasfilm and Disney, also revealing that he is still peripherally involved with Episode 8 and 9, saying... I have a little information. Star Wars Episode Eight director Ryan Johnson is a friend of mine. I'm getting to know Colin Trevorrow, who is going to direct Episode Nine, so I feel very involved with it. The as-yet-untitled Star Wars story featuring Han Solo is set for a May 25th, 2018 release date. Schnepp, are you excited to know Kasdan is still involved somewhat with Episode Eight and Nine? Yeah, I'm definitely excited. I think, you know, Lawrence Kasdan has brought so much to the Star Wars universe. It's great to see him, you know, obviously not very deeply involved. He's writing it with his son. So that's that's pretty cool news and that he's going to be involved. I think you were saying, Christian, as like a consultant for the, you know, the later Skywalker uh, films makes total sense. I, I, I think, you know, Kazan in the Star Wars universe can do no wrong. So I'm, I'm happy to see that he's involved. Yeah, there was a question, I think, that came up on Jedi Council either last week or the week before where because uh, he said people are saying it was his last one and he was done. Uh, for screenwriting and we all pretty much I think in unison said it doesn't mean he's done from the Star Wars <laughs> no! universe. it's not gonna happen you know because the guy loves Star Wars he loves Han Solo obviously right. but he loves being part of Star Wars and help telling the story and he's back in the fray now to be able to do that so I love and if you're Colin Trevorrow or Ryan Johnson why wouldn't you want to consult with Lawrence Kasdan, yeah. so y you you know that he's it's and it's also nice fan service to let everyone know yes he's there they're they're talking to him he's helping with story points he's I mean that that picture that they showed with in for episode seven when he was sitting down on the set yeah. with JJ I think we're going to see more pictures like that because he's going to be around he's going to be helping so yeah it's, it's I, great I would love to see him direct the Boba Fett film you know I st I don't think they're going to have a Boba Fett film you think they just canned it I think they're going to turn it into a TV series really yeah I think it makes more sense to do it like you can do the underworld because they were going to do an underworld sure um, TV series for a long time before right. any of the stuff and they've got like happen. 52 scripts that are just sitting that's on what a shelf I mean somewhere. so I think that you could put Boba Fett in there still tell some stories I, uh, I'd watch that it'd be a dark you could you could you do it Call it Underworld, I don't Star know. Wars Underworld, maybe thirteen, thirteen, or something. a Star Wars story. I, it's yeah. Underworld, a Star Wars yeah. tale. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I wouldn't rule out Lawrence Kasdan directing something, maybe not Star Wars related in the future. But he said that while he's just a little fatigued with screenwriting because it's such an intricate process, he does still love directing. And he directed movies like I think he, I think he did Wyatt Earp and he did The Big Chill. He knows his way around a camera. But when you have a guy that's been this involved in this praise in the Star Wars universe, I love that he's on the periphery of Episode Eight and Nine because. It means that if he's proofreading somebody else's writing for Star Wars, he's not just like your buddy. Hey, can you check the script out? Let me know if it works okay. This is Lawrence Kasdan. One of the things that really stood out to me about The Force Awakens, why I liked it so much better than the prequels, is because of the dialogue. It was short. It was snappy. It was to the point. Nobody writes Han Solo better than Lawrence Kasdan, or maybe even Harrison Ford for that matter. So if Kasdan and his son are working on the Han Solo movie, it gives me a great amount of hope that the movie is going to be great. I still am not sold that we need a Han Solo movie movie okay i'm not sold that anybody else can be han solo other than harrison ford this alden kid he's got chops i know that lawrence kasdan helping write for him gives me a lot of hope i still am not quite there yet let me ask you guys a question because you guys are super star wars fans and i love star wars kessel run they're going to show that yes and how did he hang out with Chewbacca? Is there a life debt? What do you guys think? Well, Star Wars sweat. I will tell you, we're absolutely going to see both of those things. Nice. I see, think that's so. all I want I from think a Han the whole Solo movie. movie is Han in the Millennium Falcon at Thunder Road, and he that's keeps it. trying to break the Parsecs <laughs> record. And it's two hours of him being like 13 Parsecs, 14 Parsecs, then he finally gets the 12 Parsecs roll credits. I think that the Parsecs <laughs> is going to be a big part of the movie as and him meeting Chewbacca. Um, I think you're going to learn more about the life debt in the novel that's coming out. Like there, there's Chuck Wendings who did... Um, the first aftermath, which is kind of disappointment, is doing a second one called Life Dead, and it's mm -hmm. all about Chewie. And, and that's Han. canon styles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they probably you'll probably you might I don't know if you necessarily learn the first part of it, but you'll get more into the lore. I think that comes out like next month.
Oh, wow. So, All right, what's next? The string of live-action remakes and adaptations from Disney's Library of Classic continues, with the latest announcement coming yesterday, announcing a title and release date for its Mary Poppins sequel slash reboot, Mary Poppins Returns. Emily Blunt will play the magical nanny that takes care of a pair of troublesome kids. She'll be joined by Lin-Manuel Miranda, the musical theater genius behind Hamilton, who will play a street lamp lighter named Jack, a new creation for the film. Mary Poppins Returns will be helmed by Chicago director Rob Marshall, and will now be hitting theaters on December 25th, 2018. Mark, thoughts on the Mary Poppins Returns cast? Okay, good. Sounds talented. Don't really care about Mary Poppins at all. But, I mean, look, the talent involved in there. I don't. I, I, I grew up watching Mary Poppins when I was a kid. And Julie they call Andrews me the dream crusher. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying, like, like, are you guys really that excited to see Mary Poppins yes. in the theater again? Yes. You are not. I am you're lying. So you, you're going to take your daughter with Emily to it. Blunt. <laughs> Emily Blunt sounds like a fantastic. Like, it's very hard to cast. It, we're talking about casting a new Han Solo, casting a new Mary Poppins, following in Julie Andrews' footsteps right. is no easy task. I think Emily Blunt is up to it, despite what I saw from her in Hun Huntsman Winter's, you know, ice capades. So <laughs> I think that she's going to be the right choice. Rob Marshall, who did the Oscar-winning Chicago, mm -hmm. is clearly a great call for directing this film but I'm just not that excited about Mary Poppins however the cast itself they sound great well let me ask you did you watch Mary Poppins a lot when you were a kid or you just didn't dig it no I dug Mary Poppins when I was five and then I'm like I don't need to sit down and watch this movie when I'm in college it's not a great <laughs> college watch it's not something that I'm really into as an adult but I get that Mary Poppins right. is a magical film I'm just not going to be lining up to be like oh Mary Poppins I can't wait to see the first teaser trailer you yeah, know when yeah. you see you're sitting on the cloud with the umbrella it's like I know who that is I just don't care that much what about if Han it. Solo had a cameo. Why would Han Solo have a cameo in Mary Poppins? Now you're not Disney? making sense. Disney? God, no. you're awful. <laughs> <laughs> I am awful. Um, I'm actually pretty excited for this, you rat, uh, because Emily Blunt, and you saw what she did in Into the Woods. That's sure. one. Now, I didn't love Into the Woods, but I thought, okay, wait, she absolutely can compete in this genre. Like, you mm -hmm. know, she's she can sing. I want to see what she's able to do. When, you, when they announced it, it was perfect casting. Everybody, I mean, and I don't think you disagree with that, is that that is someone who sh was, like, born to play Mary Poppins. And I think adding this guy, what I know him for, everyone's like, is Hamilton, but he, he, for me, He's the guy that did the the Java song in Force Awakens. He's the one. He's the guy. You know that the Cantina Ooh. song. Oh, okay, that's him. Yeah. So that's why I'm excited. About I also it, hear Hamilton is like crushing. I know. I know. I hear it's a phenomenal. Yeah. Well, um, I think a lot more people are going to go see Hamilton. Like I hadn't even heard of Hamilton until like this news dropped. Mm -hmm. So that's how out of the Broadway box office world I am. But now I'm, I'm, my interest is peaked. And I gotta say, like. I loved Mary Poppins as a kid. It's it, it's definitely it's a family film. So I think it's great that they're going ahead and saying we're not going to remake Mary Poppins because that lives as its own thing with Julie Andrews. She's Mary Poppins. We're making another like a sequel to Mary Poppins. The only way you can do it when it's like like thirty or almost forty years later is you've got to recast it. It has you know I mean so look it makes sense to me. I'm interested to see what they're gonna do with it. Am I jumping around like woohoo like backflips and stuff about Mary Poppins the Return or whatever? Yeah, it's that's called? what you acted like about two minutes. You know what? <laughs> I was kind of backflipping a little yeah, bit. Yeah, I'm but, not. I am not crapping on the lore of Mary Poppins. That movie is great, but if you're gonna release a new live action one, it's the same way that I felt about like Cinderella. Where I'm like, yeah, I hope it's really good, but I'm not like, like I'm not buying my tickets on Fandango a Look, month ahead of time. I'm, I'm more excited about Mary Poppins: The Return or whatever it's called than Into the Woods. You know, like when they come out with some musical, it's like, oh, here's another sloppy, sure. sloppity, flippity flop. I'm like, yeah, whatever. This is Mary Poppins, at least I know it's going to be fun. They're going to have a lot of production value with cool, crazy Mary Poppins dance sequences where they're jumping around uh, sit chimney sweeps and whatnot. Do we get animated penguins in I this? Certainly, they I certainly, they better. I had pleasure. I performed for Dick Van Dyke. He was at the crowd really? at the comedy store one night, and I got to, and I and I thanked Dick Van Dyke, and I said, Mary Poppins is the greatest thing of all time. Yes. <laughs> Might have fibbed a little bit, but hey, it's Dick Van Dyke. good you man. Do? Dick yeah. Van Dyke is the awesomest. All right, before we move on, let's check in with Wendy and the Wendy Cam. Wendy, what are they saying about the topics that we just covered? All right, well, let's go all the way back up to the Planet Hulk storyline. Some of the chat is very excited for the Planet Hulk storyline. Colin Spatton says, I am happy they're at least doing something with the Planet Hulk storyline. That mix with the amazing cast makes me super pumped for this movie. But not everybody in the cast is agreeing. Uh, Pablo Gocher says, Planet Hulk isn't a very good story. It doesn't convert to a movie. And Admit916 mm -hmm. says, Planet Hulk is so unpersonable and inconsequential of a storyline. 
Moving on to Kasdan's wow. involvement, episode eight or nine, Jason Creed says, major buy for Kasdan, keeping the band together is very important to the fans. Mm. And Open Newt plays games that's still not sold on the solo solo, hoping it's good <laughs> regardless. And to our Mary Poppins cast, the chat's really liking the Emily Blunt uh, casting choice as Mary Poppins, but a lot don't want to see the remake of Mary Poppins. And I have to say, a lot of the chat, Mark Ellis, agrees with you. Well, uh, oh, really? Because I just got a tweet. Not, not on the chat. I just got a tweet. Some kid, and all he said is boo. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jason Creed says this. The biggest buy right now is for Rob Marshall. Chicago was a great musical. Well, look, mm. it's not a remake. It's a sequel. So that's right. the other thing you got to remember is like they're not remaking Mary. So it's the original Mary Poppins canon. Yes. Yes. Then this is the family from the original Mary Poppins coming to visit Mary Poppins yeah. years later, and there's some kind of bad stuff went down, so they have to t tell Mary about the bad stuff. <laughs> bad stuff. How Call bad is the stuff? Hey. Harley Gray wrote it. <laughs> okay, good. Now we're we're getting back into the yeah. Star Wars universe. And so the, hopefully Harloff Minor makes an appearance in the new <laughs> Mary Poppins movie. And Planet Man. Hulk is not. It's not going to be ba like they said. It's an amalgamation, so it's going to take elements from. Secret Wars. It's also going to take elements from Contest of Champions. That's where the collector's uh, brother comes from, the Grand Master. The guy is Jeff Goldblum is playing. I'm going to take this person and this person and make them fight. Whatever. That's what it's going to be. So. All right. So while you guys are tweeting out and booing Ellis right now, <laughs> we are going to be switching to buy or sell. Ash is going to read some more topics in the world of movie news. And Schnepp, myself, and Ellis are just going to buy it or sell it. What's up first? Yesterday, Pixar released some new concept art and story details from their second sequel to their Cars franchise, Cars 3. In an article from USA Today, Lightning McQueen, voiced by Owen Wilson, needs help competing in the increasingly high-tech racing world, so he recruits a new trainer to help. The sleek yellow Cruz Ramirez, a young Hispanic female race car who instructs Lightning McQueen. Director Brian Fee also shared some thoughts on the concept art, with Cruz trying to figure out how Lightning can learn some new tricks. He said, think of where he'd be in his career now in real time. McQueen is not an old man, but he's one of the older cars on the circuit with new rookies coming in. People start to wonder and ask when he might retire. Christian buyers sell the new images and plot from Cars 3. Sell? I hate this franchise. <laughs> uh, I, I, the second one was awful. It was so bad. Um, but uh, th this is like, well, well, let's be fast and furious now. And it does, I, I don't. I'm not excited about this. I think it was a. Compl I think I love what Pixar's been doing lately. I want to see them go back and do some more original stuff. Get away from this franchise. I. I mean, unless they really. The first one was okay, and if they switch it and go back to the first one and don't focus on that stupid tow truck again and they don't see you don't see him in that one so maybe they just focus on owen wilson's character but i don't care and this is looks like nothing i want to see uh, i quite enjoyed cars too which well, let's just keep the mary poppins hate coming but i do have to sell these images and the plot because it's nothing that screams we needed to make this movie other than we know it's going to make a crap ton of money at the box mm -hmm. office if you go to disneyland they just open the the cars ride or whatever it's it's a two-hour wait like there's a huge huge audience for this movie. I understand why you want to make it. I understand it's going to make a lot of money. I just don't see why I need to go see this movie. It's nothing that I'm reading. That I like that they're bringing in new cars. I like that the cars are going to be a very diverse bunch of casting and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. It's just like, I don't know why we need a Cars 3 when there's so many other Pixar properties that I'd rather see turned into yeah. franchises over Cars. Yeah, like Planes 4. Let's get that going into production, guys. I sell this. I don't like the Cars franchise. I could care less about it. I'm glad it's a ride because that's really all it's made for is to get inside and ride around with your kids with big eyes. Hey, the Cars have eyes. Sorry, I sell it. Is the Cars ride good? Because it was two hour, a uh, two-hour wait, so we didn't go. But I'm is sure, the Cars ride I'm sure it's fantastic. It. You, I mean, you won't do it simply because of the movie? I, I, won't, I won't support it, and I didn't even know there was a ride. <laughs> wow. Ashley, have you ever no. been to Disneyland to the Cars I've ride? been to Disneyland, but I've never been on the Cars ride. The wait is too long. I yeah. hate the Cars franchise, but I will go on the Cars I mean, ride. I didn't even know there was a ride. That's what I, I'm saying. I have, so. I have not seen it yet, but I remember yeah. when they were making it, and it's like, I'll go on it. All right. Yeah. The challenge has been issued. The yeah. first one of us, we got to report back. Yeah. All right. Uh, what's next? <laughs> Transformers The Last Night is already in full marketing gear, with Michael Bay yesterday taking to his Instagram account to reveal the villain for the fifth movie in the series, and it should be no big surprise for the hardcore fans. <coughs> Bay's reminder of the film's start of production date came with a bundled revelation that Megatron will be returning, with his post featuring a close-up of the de de deception... De dead pick... Decepticon. Decepticon leader. Decepticon Megatron. On the post, of Bay wrote, Megatron. Say it right. <laughs> this week, production Megatron is back. Megatron. 
Transformers The Last Night will see the return of Mark Wahlberg and Josh Duhamel with other cast members yet to be announced. The film hits theaters on June 23rd, 2017. Schnapp Virus saw the return of Megatron and Transformers 5. And I'm a dick. Ah, I'm a dick for hating Mary Poppins. I'm a dick. Ah, Megatron's back. I sell it. <laughs> That's it. That's all you got? All right. You want anything else? Or no, you're done. done. He's, he's, he's been done. knocked out by Transformers. No, Mars no you're Shep. done? No, well, I'm not it. done. I'm not done. <laughs> you know, all, all I want in a, in a Transformers the last night, I think I said this a couple times, I want Rom to show up. Rom the Space Knight, that horrible toy from Parker Brothers that looks like a duck that can't stand but had an awesome comic book series run in Marvel back in the 80s. We need Rom to come back and beat up all the Transformers. That's all I got to say. I am going to buy it on one condition, that they get Frank Welker to do the voice and not Hugo Weaving. I love Hugo Weaving, but I want the original voice back, the original Megatron voice. They got Peter Cullen to do Prime. Mm. Let's get the original voice of Megatron back. Then I'll be okay with it. Explain to me a little bit why he's able to come back and they revamp him to the Megatron that I knew in the, if they're really going to revamp this franchise and give us a better version like they say they're going to with all the story points, then I'll be all right with it. If it's the same stupid Megatron that we got from the first one or two, then no, then, I, then I'm going to sell it. But I'm, I'm just crossing my fingers hoping that they're going to actually recast the voice, but we'll see. How tightly are you keeping those fingers crossed? Uh, super crossed. I, I'm, I'm pretty much going to have to resell this thing. You're going to lose all blood <laughs> yeah. flow to your two <laughs> fingertips because there's no way that th this... I'm selling this because it's Transformers 5 and Megatron has been involved in the other four crap heaps from the Transformers yeah. series that why on earth would this get me any confidence going into Transformers the last night like if you're gonna say oh we brought in this great a team of writers and they're gonna create this new lore that we can have going forward but now we're gonna bring back Megatron again I'll be honest I thought Megatron I thought we killed him in some one of the other movies but he just keeps showing up the guys that he's like the Chucky doll he just keeps coming back and preventing us from having new inventive cool villains so if this movie <laughs> says it's gonna be different and it's gonna be better than the other ones how are you gonna pull that off when you're bringing back the same villain that just is gonna be another lumbering 45 Five minute fight scene to end the movie. I sell this. Yeah. Oh. Totally. Right. Well, that's <laughs> conviction. All right, what's next? <laughs> We're just a month and a half away from seeing if director Paul Feig can deliver an entertaining reboot of the classic Ghostbusters. Many fans have already written off the film, while others are holding out hope that it will be much better than the early trailers have indicated. And now, thanks to an original Ghostbuster, we have our first reaction to the movie. Star Dan Aykroyd took some time yesterday to praise the film following a test screening posting his reaction to Facebook. It read... As originator of the original, saw test screening of new movie. Apart from brilliant, genuine performances from the cast, both female and male, it has more laughs and more scares than the first two films, plus Bill Murray's in it. As one of millions of man fans and race stands, I'm paying to see that and bring all my friends. Ghostbusters stars Kristen Wiig, Melissa McCarthy, Kate McKinnon, Leslie Jones, and Chris Hemsworth, and it hits theaters on July 15th. Mark, Firesell Dan Aykroyd's comments about the reboot Ghostbusters. I have to sell them, not because I'm not is somewhat optimistic still going into Ghostbusters, because I do have hope for that movie being funny and entertaining, but it just seems like such lip service the way this quote reads. It I know how much Dan Aykroyd is tied into Ghostbusters. I'm a huge fan of Dan Aykroyd. If you haven't seen him recently, or you never saw him on Saturday Night Live, go back and watch just pure comedic genius drip off the TV for five years. But here it just seems like he's try he seems like a carnival barker just trying to get people into the theater like oh, i'm gonna pay first of all ray stance does not have to pay money to go see the ghostbusters movie okay he can walk up to any theater in the world and be like oh hi i'm dan Aykroyd. can i go see ghostbusters like yeah Here's a free popcorn. Like, he doesn't have to pay to see it. He he said that Bill Murray's in it. That sounded like he's trying to sell us on coming back into the theater. So I didn't like the, the sales pitch, and it felt like a sales pitch. So I have to sell these comments, even though I love Dan Aykroyd, and I still want this movie to be good. I sell them for the exact same reasons. Dan Aykroyd used to do a sketch on Saturday Night Live where he was selling everything. In the the Bassomatic? Uh, yeah. yeah. It's yeah. Just, it's, that's what that's <laughs> totally. those comments sounded like. It it's just like, it's got scares. It's got laughs. It's got Bill Murray. <laughs> uh, right. 
that's what it sounded like the whole thing so come on come see it come see it because there's so much cleanup right now it's like an inflatable thing yeah sure. like, he is. Like, they wouldn't even they, would I have to pay for outside it? the theater I might even, I, they wouldn't even charge me for it it would you got I would pay money for this now I'm not I, and I you know he wants it to be good and, and the thing is he probably did think it was good but sometimes and I hope that it's good. I just there's so much cleanup right now with this movie. Paul Feig's coming out and defending it. Melissa McCarthy's coming out because they're doing cleanup. The trailer was the most disliked movie trailer in YouTube's history. And you look, and there's, there's a reason for that. And not just because there's women in the movie. That's that that's silly. Are there some idiots that are just doing it because of that? Sure. But you look at. I think everybody that's talked. I have been excited about the movie before I saw a trailer. I liked Paul Feig. I liked what he's done so far with Kristen Wiig, with Melissa McCarthy. The movie, to me, just looks bad. Now, I hope that it's going to be good. But when you hear these comments, it's Dan Aykroyd who's invested in it. He's probably his producer on the movie. He's been wanting to make the remake for a very long time. So he's not going to go, yeah, you guys are right. I shouldn't have done this. You know, so, yeah, I just can't. It's the same thing with James Cameron's buying Terminator Salvation. It's like, right. no, you're not. You're just... You're just giving them lip service so you can get the property back soon. But at least when Cameron did it with Terminator, he wasn't saying, oh, this is the best Terminator movie ever made. Right. Like, Dan Aykroyd, right. in this, he said that it's funnier and scarier than the first two Ghostbusters. It's like, are you... Are you high? Right. It's, it's, we're not even, <laughs> none of us are even looking for it to be at that level. Right. We just want the movie right. to be good and, and maybe take it in a different direction. So if he said something in that vein, right. I would have I been more inclined to buy it. But you're right, I have to sell this. But this is like, this is the Dan Aykroyd of now where he's like always oh, hawking his vodka, yeah. his skull vodka. He's like selling a lot of stuff. So, I mean, I sell his comments, but I actually buy that. I'm actually really looking forward to the Ghostbusters yeah. movie because. The trailers didn't do it, but I think when you see the movie in context, I trust Paul Feig, you know? I think that he's got a great comedic sensibility, and he wouldn't be putting together, like, yeah, we just threw this piece of, uh, you know, together. You know, it's uh, we, we all don't, we didn't know what we were doing. We're not making a comedy film. I just think it doesn't play in the, wor in the world of the modern-day trailers, so the way it's shot, it just doesn't work. I mean, I went back and looked at some of the other trailers from his films, and they don't, they really, they don't come together in trailers. They come together as right. a full film. So I have to, I have to reserve my right to actually say that I think that Ghostbusters new film is actually going to be fun and good, but I don't buy Dan Aykroyd's trailer. I mean, his comments sound like a carnival barker. Mm -hmm. yeah. So uh, I have to take issue with a comment that's coming here. It says, uh, "Live Me Alone." Says critics judging the movies before watching make their profession irrelevant. Then what is the point of a trailer? What is the point of a trailer then? If you're not supposed to go, that looks good, right. that looks bad. What Tra is the point of a trailer? Well, trailers can be judged by critics. Every single person out there in the universe Everyone. who watched a trailer is a critic. That's the point yeah. of a trailer. When you see the trailer, you go, oh, that looks good. I, I want to see, see that. Or that looks horrible. Not I don't want to see, see it. it. So that comment makes no sense whatsoever. Well, I, I understand if he's saying that that we that, there, that anybody is seeing a trailer and then judging the entire movie based on it. If you say it, like this movie stinks, that. if you see the trailer yeah. and go, oh, this movie sucks, then yeah. yes, then, then that comment is relevant. But if you're saying, from what I'm seeing so far, I don't have high hopes. I think this movie is right. going to be bad. That is the point. Of a trailer, right? Nothing in this trailer made me want to see the film, right? If if that's the, the what the trailer, the reaction of the trailer, then that's the, the badly put together trailer. It's a big difference. Has nothing to do it, with yeah. the film. There's a huge difference from saying this movie is great versus saying this movie looks great, yeah. or this movie's bad versus this movie looks bad. Transformers: Four Age of Extinction had an amazing trailer. I couldn't wait to see that movie. That movie sucked. Yeah. Yeah. So I was like. <laughs> It's a constant. <laughs> you're constantly being sold a bill of goods, or you're like, oh "My God, the trailer's amazing!" Then, oh, they showed everything in the trailer. The rest of the movie's yeah. horrible. So it, it's just, yeah, it's just, it's just dopey when someone says that you're you're judging the movie as a whole. Right? No, we're not. No, we're not. I haven't yeah. seen the movie. As I just a think whole. that I have person, no idea what that the movie person was. doesn't understand. I'll say, yeah, saying the Transformer: same Age of Extinction sucks. Okay, Transformer: <laughs> right. The Last Night sounds like it could suck. That's the <laughs> huge yeah. difference. So silly. All right, what's uh, Wendy? What were they saying about buy or sell? Well, today we should just rename it to the sell section of the show <laughs> instead of the buy or sell. Sorry, going back all the way up to Cars 3, the chat sold this, um, and Thunder got Kiro 770 said, sell, give us Incredibles 2. And yes. Mark, you need to go on the Cars ride. <laughs> it's actually a lot of fun, and hop in the single rider line, so it'll cut your time in half. 
Mm. Wait, are you just assuming that I'm not going to be accompanied by anybody no, when I go to Disneyland? No, it doesn't matter. Yeah. It just that seemed like a huge assumption. Oh, Mark has no friends. He's going to be walking around Disneyland with, by himself. So. Just pretend you're single. Like, hey. you, all of us will go in the single line and yeah, we'll all okay. get in the car. I'm sure my girlfriend would love it. Hey, babe, I'm going to the singles yeah. line. It's either that or wait two hours. I'm just giving you a tip. You know what? Don't take my tip. It's cool. We're going to move on to the next episode. <laughs> <laughs> when uh, he's trying to help. That's it. All right, let's move on. All right, Megatron's return in Transformers 5. Again, the chat is selling this, but I did some see some comments saying that this is a buy for them. Glitter Geek TV says, I am done with this Transformers crap. I was done after Transformers 3. I didn't even watch Transformers 4 because I was like, why waste my money and movie tickets where I live? It's only $6 to see a movie. <laughs> and Dan Aykroyd's <laughs> comments on the rebooted Ghostbusters, seeing a lot of sales. Again, some are very nervous about this movie. Colin Spalton says, I like that Aykroyd is supporting the film, but it means as much... But it means as much when James Cameron said that Terminator Genesis was the first true sequel to T2. And Ignacio Padilla says, I buy what Dan says. It's so hard to look forward to this movie because of its trailers. I don't mind the cast. I am optimistic to see it next month. All right. There you go, guys. Thank you for all the comments and chiming in about said topics. Now it's time to move on to AMC Rewind. This is everything that came out in the theater either 10 years ago, 20 years ago. Ashley, what came out 10 and 20 years ago? 10 years ago, we have The Breakup and The Omen, and 20 years ago, The Phantom and The Rock. Well, the one that stands out to me 10 years ago that I can't believe is 10 years ago was The Breakup, which the reason uh, the movie itself was okay, which I remember because I went and saw it with an ex girlfriend right after we broke up. It was a weird, weird, weird date to do that too. <laughs> so wait, that you took a new date. We just had broken up. Yeah. And we went to see The Breakup. Why are you seeing movies when you break Dude, up? That's what it, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it was bizarre. That's, That's weird. Um, that is bizarre. classic. Yeah. That is vintage 2006 Harlow. Yeah, and it was 2006. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, but that's the one I remembered. And I also remember the movie not being so great. But then 20 years ago, you, I mean, you talk about The Rock. It's yeah. still the best movie Michael Bay has done. It's the one that stands out to me. It's a really good movie. Welcome to The Rock. Yeah, that The Rock actually got me in trouble. That was the dividing line between a huge movie fan and somebody that just wanted to have some kicks on a Friday or Saturday night because me and a bunch of my friends from high school, we all went to go see The Rock. We managed to get in, even though it was rated R, and we're watching it, but we saw the last showing that night, and we all had a curfew. And so I, a couple of my friends started getting squirrely, and they're like, I, I, I can't get in trouble, I'll get grounded. So they left so that their parents wouldn't get mad at them. So they got home at his curfew. And I, I blew right past curfew. I got home late. My parents were not thrilled, but I told them I saw this awesome action movie. And then I spent the next half hour explaining to my dad how cool the plot is. We know they have to break into Alcatraz. Right. Mm. And Nicolas Cage is in, and he's a huge Beatles fan. So I won over at least half of the parenting core. Nice. I love The Rock. The Phantom is an all-time great movie to watch if you want some yucks, unintentional yucks. It's not good. Yeah, slam that movie. That's a horrible. <laughs> the Phantom is horrible. It's not. I can't recommend it even for yucks. It's just boring. Oh, it's pretty funny though. It's it's a it's droning bad. mess yeah, with yeah. like Billy Zane in a stupid purple spandex outfit jumping yep. around. It's dumb. It's got Timothy Dalton with a weird green skull <laughs> laser thing at the end. Do not see it. I'm not even trying to make it. Now I'm making it sound fun. I'll just stop talking about it. Uh, the Rock is the movie to talk yeah. about. If you've not seen The Rock. Fantastic, incredible action film. Sean Connery, they Nicholas Cage playing like an agent. Is mm -hmm. they, they have these like weird uh, little green, speaking of green things, they have like these weird green like nuclear radioactive things that constantly keep getting thrown and getting caught. I thought it was such a fun film. The chase scenes, the action scenes. It is one of Michael Bay's best films. I put it up there with Pain and Gain. I mean, Bay has done a couple of really good films. I just don't like any of those Transformer films he's done, but he's actually a, a really good filmmaker when he gets the right material, and I think The Rock is the perfect kind of material for Bay to return to after he does another Transformers. You know, you know what's odd is that you can go back and watch The Rock now, and you can see the Michael Bay-isms taking shape. Totally. You can see a lot of the slow motion. You can yep. see just a random car chase that does not need to be there. But it was fun for that movie. And then when it starts to infringe upon you know, war or something like, like as, as as mythologically rich as Transformers, that's when it just falls flat for me. But when he's doing something like The Rock or 13 Hours, I thought was great. Mm -hmm. When he's doing stuff like that, he is a good director. Yeah, and he's, it's a, a really good story. The screenplay was really well done. Mm -hmm. It's got amazing talent. Ed Harris, Nicolas Cage, right. Sean Connery, all of them do great roles in the film. It's a really fun film. So that's the 20 year film you got to see. All right. Thank you again to our friends at AMC for bringing us AMC Rewind. Now it's time for Mailbag, where you guys have submitted questions. We went through them. We're going to answer some. And before we do that, make sure that you're also tweeting out at Collider Video. 
Ms. Mo will be checking that. We'll be doing live tweets after Mailbag. But what's up first with Mailbag? Cody Enos writes, Dear Collider, when someone is complimenting a film or performance, they will always applaud the actor, but some of the best decisions by characters are actually done from the writer. So I was wondering, when is the right time to applaud the actor, and when is the right time to applaud the writer? Uh, who the hell knows? I mean, because it's like sometimes, <laughs> well, you don't know. Because unless you know. Unless you know exactly like when it was the actor that w maybe put something a little extra into it or it was the writer that maybe wrote that scene. We aren't always privy to know exactly mm -hmm. what they did. So I think you always kind of give kudos to both the writer and the actor knowing that. And and the, the other thing is that you got to remember that there's we've talked about how many times that studios get involved and mess with stuff. There are a lot of times that studios get involved and help with stuff. Mm -hmm. There are notes from executives that say, well, what if the character actually did this? And then the writer goes, oh, yeah, I didn't think about that. Puts that in there. And then the actor puts a spin on it. So it's a collaboration with everyone. So it's hard to say, well, that was a great moment. Let's applaud everyone. Mm. You just appreciate it as it comes in. That's the way I see it. Yeah, I think it breaks down more to like auteur writers. Like, you know, you have some, like you have Woody Allen. You have a whole bunch of right. different uh, Charlie Kaufman where you go see a film and it's kind of based on the writing and, the, and that person who's behind it, if they're a writer or just a writer director. But their body of work has this this tone to it that you're like, oh, I can I know what I'm going to I know what to kind of expect, but it might be a twist here and a twist there. So I think those are the kind of films where like you're basically knowing that who the writer and possibly the director is going into the film. A lot of films you go see, you don't know who the writer or director is because you're drawn in by the, the talent, you know, or the story. So those are the ty type of moments where it really is hard to discern who came up with that line. Oh, that was ad lib by the by the writer or that was ad lib by the actor at the moment. It wasn't even in the script. So you find that out maybe years later after the film is out. So I think film is a collaborative medium. So it's really uh, unless it's a, an auteur type of a film, it's everyone's involved and it's it's a mix. It's every scene is different. Sometimes it's, it's like you said, it's studio driven. We don't like that scene. We think it should go this way. Everybody goes with that. So, I mean, it's it's really is like a collaborative medium. It, it really is hard to do with comedies and smaller movies mm -hmm. to discern whether it is the writer or the actor because like like Neighbors 2 or even something like Popstar, which I laughed a lot at last night. It's like, okay, how much of this was made up on the spot and how much of it was actually written in the dialogue? With Popstar, at least, you know, a lot of the songs, they, 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 they meticulously craft those things. So you give a lot of credit to the writing there. With big budget action movies or with a huge space epic, like with Force Awakens, the reason why we love Lawrence Kasdan is that it's no accident that the actors are saying those lines. Those things have been so carefully crafted because the movie, everything has to work in that movie yeah. with these huge effects and with these shots. Same thing with an animated movie. There's not a lot of room for improvisation. You can go back and reanimate some stuff, and I'm sure Robin Williams had a ball in the voiceover studio when he was doing Aladdin. When you watch a lot of the Pixar movies, the reason why they're so sharp and so good is because they really concentrate on the writing before they even start animating the movie. So so they know that they have something good to work with. Yeah, and even above beyond that, with Pixar, they do these incredible. They have entire departments do dedicated to just story, mm -hmm. and their story sessions are basically um, storyboarding. Is what they're like. It's telling the story and storyboarding, and they have competitions, and it goes down to the best three, and so that, that's how you get the actually the best scene. It's a combination of all those, and I want to definitely give a shout out to all the punch up writers who never get credited, mm -hmm. the ghost writers, and that's something that. All, you mentioned comedy films, they bring in like eight people, they sit around a table, they all get five grand a day, and they go through the script from page one to the very end, and they punch it up. And what punch up means is basically let's let's add these lines, let's pop, you, you take this character, you seem like you got this character, you add, make it funnier, you juice it up, that's what punch up is. So some of those best lines that you read or, he, or that you end up hearing in a movie might not have even been originated by the guy who's getting the credit, the guy or girl who's getting the credit, it could be a punch up. You session. know who's really good at that? Patton Oswalt. And you know who also was really good at that until he started doing his own movies is a guy named Joss Whedon. Mm. He got called a lot of times yeah. to go into the studio and punch up various things. Sure. Yeah. And then he's like, oh, I'll just start doing my own stuff. And I think that panned out pretty well. Definitely. Doctors. All right, what's next? Jamie Bowers writes, Hi guys, with all the talk about possible superhero burnout, is it possible that The Rock, taking on every role in Hollywood, in Hollywood, is it possible mm, people may get burned out on The Rock? Could that hurt franchises he has had agreed to? Um, yes, it could. Because right now, we just hear about him doing everything. Now, you also got to remember how this works out here. Like, There are a lot of times 
that movies get announced and people get attached to projects and they don't happen. Right. They just kind of disappear. And you're like, oh, whatever happened to that one thing? Eh, it kind of fell apart. And, it, it will, and then we'll get a question in the mailbag. So, and you guys heard anything new about this project? And it's still in development. Right. So he's attaching himself to as much as he can right now while he's in at the top of his game. And But yeah, it's, it's <coughs> going to be tough. Like if, if The Rock is in every single franchise, we do get burnt out on actors and we see him way too much. And it's harder to take them as different characters if they're doing so many different movies, but we don't know the release schedules on these things. Remember, he's in, he's announcing movies like Black Adam that's coming out in like 2050. So right. it's so all these, it's it's a matter of when he's doing them. He knows how to market himself. He's clearly done that very well. If the release dates are part up to where we have enough time to breathe a little bit before we get another rock, but if it's like rock two months two months later, two months later, then yeah, it's going to get a little tiresome for anybody. Even as likable as The Rock is, it's, it's certainly possible. You make a great point because most actors don't engage their fans in the way that The Rock does, where right. it's like, this is my slate for the next five years. You don't get that with like a Christian Bale. You know, he's not telling you everything he's going to be right. in, and then we'd be like, oh, are we going to get Bale fatigue? Christian Bale's probably going to be in more movies in the next five years than The Rock is, but we just don't hear about it, and it's not this big epic event, or at least an Instagram post with The Rock where, oh, this movie's coming out, then this movie's coming out. There's always the risk. It's we're gonna get burned out on an actor, yeah. even somebody that we really enjoy seeing. I just think with The Rock, he's got the highest tolerance of anybody right now. Whereas somebody like your boy Jai Courtney, if he is announcing all these movies that are coming out, we're like, oh, okay, easy there, Jai. Let's just see one at a time. <laughs> Slow down. With The Rock, yeah. we just love that guy so much. We we root for him. The question is, once he gets to be in all these franchises, we see all these different movies, are we still going to want him to make more? Or that's the point when you get the fatigue. It's not when the movies are coming out. It's after you see them and you're walking right. out and you're like, I'm a little tired of that guy. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't see the fatigue happening yet. I mean, unless he's in a remake of The Rock, which, you know, would be really weird. The Rock's in The Rock. I would actually love to see yeah. that. That would actually be a good idea. Yeah. Yeah. So I take that back. But look, he's, he's in Central Intelligence. That's the one that's coming out now. And that's mm -hmm. a comedy. Then like a couple, maybe four or five months later, you got The Fast and the Furious where he plays Hobbs, a little different. He's got the dagger, you know, chin, beard thing. That's about it. But he looks like The Rock. So he's not really changing his, his look that much. So everyone, when you go see him in Baywatch, whenever that comes out, I can't even remember next when that, next time. year. So that's like a year from now. So I don't think anyone's going to have that kind of fatigue. He's just announcing so many of, of his projects. You're like, how many things is he doing? It's sort of like Guillermo del Toro, where you're like, I got like these 20 projects. Probably only two of them are going to happen. So <laughs> Black Adam, I don't think is going to happen. I've heard it way too many times. Lobo, I don't think that's going to happen. I've heard it way too many times. Why did he make a big deal about Doc Savage? Because that is going to happen. And that's got Shane Black. That's it's that's going to happen. And that's going to be a really fun film. So I think that's the thing he's doing is like, he's constantly announcing the things he's doing, like the Ludlum franchise. Jumanji. Well, Jumanji. Yeah, well, that's but that's another comedy with Kevin yeah, Hart. So yeah. he's lining these things up so that I don't think we're going to have that kind of fatigue as long as it comes out every six months. You know? Yeah, it's just it, it's what I'm saying. It's just a matter of how you space it out. Yeah. But when there's a lot of projects and if, you, if they start getting announced for he's got four in 2017, you know, I, I'm not saying he does. But right. If you hear that, then it's it, it runs the risk. Well, the Ludlum franchise is the one that, you know, the Bourne kind of yeah. sequel kind of thing. Yeah. And that sounds fun, too, because that's a different side of the rock that we'll see. We see the comedy side within Central Intelligence, the, you know, the tough action star in Fu Fast and Furious. And then maybe even a little more of like a James Bondy type thing. Right. In the born like the born sequel type of Ludlum stuff, and let's also not forget about Ballers because he's right. got his TV show yeah. where he's on too. So I mean, he's the guy's working. He's voicing a, a huge Disney movie coming out in a couple of years oh, too, right, a huge right. animated Disney That's film. Right. So he's he's got a full slate, yeah. and he works out a lot. Yeah. All right, <laughs> now it is time for live Twitter questions. You guys have been submitting questions over at Collider Video, and Ashley's been going through them. What do we got? Rashad H. writes, how do you feel about the news that Jason will have a new origin story in the new Friday the 13th movie? Schnapp. <laughs> I mean, I don't really know what that... I mean, what are they going to do? <laughs> I was born on Mars. I mean, it's Crystal Lake. <laughs> Come on. What do you got? You got to mess with the origin of Jason to refresh it. Just make a new one. Well, it's his mom. Always amazing. It? Yeah, it's his mom. Yeah. I mean, it's like this kills me all the time when I hear about like, well, we're, we're we're taking it back to the basics. How many years ago did that Friday the Thirteenth come out? This the remake. No, 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 no. I'm oh, saying just the re the right. reboot. Yeah. That was like seven years ago. Well, I mean, just switching it up from Jason's mom not being the one running around. The I mean, you can mess around with the lore a little bit yeah. to refresh it, but you're right. There's certain things that you need to have 
in a Friday the 13th movie, mm-hmm. it, well, you need a hockey mask at some point. Yeah. You need a kid who's not a strong swimmer. Mm-hmm. You right. need uh, <laughs> yeah. Camp Crystal Lake. That's right. There's, there's things that you need to have in there or else you're only calling it Friday the 13th to be a cash grab. And no fan wants that. I mean, I think that they've missed enough to realize what not to do. That's what the, that, that's what the hope is. In the same way that Christian keeps his fingers crossed that, that Megatron is finally good in the last night, I'm keeping my fingers crossed that we finally get it right with these horror reboots we're talking about. Yeah, this one scares me, though. I have a little more hope with, uh, even though I, the Halloween one, mm-hmm. I don't know, but I have more mm-hmm. hope with the Halloween one than this one, especially after hearing this. Well, that's what I'm saying. Is like yeah. You're mentioning like the Halloween reboot, John Carpenter saying, we're going back to basics, we're going back to the shade. Right. We're going back to the the myth, mystical lore, the mm-hmm. supernatural elements right. of Michael Myers. You don't have to screw around. It's Camp Crystal Lake. It's Friday the Thirteenth. I mean, it blows my mind how it's like it's been been in development for like seven years. It's the easiest thing to shoot. It's like you literally can shoot it with five dollars and a pack of chiclets. You know, you're. I mean, it's a cast of teenagers at a camp. I mean, give me a break. Cut. Yeah. We need to change the chiclets. Hang on, the yeah. chiclets are empty. Yeah, we're out of chiclets. Oh, oh, so we spent another dollar. I don't know. It blows my mind. Yeah. Uh, unbelievable. I right, keep seven years. And hey, we're working on it again. Another script. Give me a break. Keep sending those tweets in. Uh, all right. What's next? Michael Blaspuller writes, what's the movie you guys can't bring up because it will start a fight between the panel? Ooh, that's a good one. <laughs> uh, what's the last like argument we had about a movie? Yeah. I mean... Like we argued about we, in in our in our Civil War spoiler review, we argued about point. elements of the yeah, movie, but not the actual movie. But the movie itself, like that. Uh, Do you want to start a, a riot in the chat room? Just have him start talking about Batman v Superman. Yeah, there That's, we go. Yeah, yeah, but it's like I I I'd agree with you a lot what, of your yeah. points, even though I thought the movie was very I'm not entertaining. Saying with us. I'm saying that, a riot with the chat. Yeah. Room. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't know. I'd have to think about that. Well, we might have to ruminate. Usually we can just answer these Twitter questions. Yeah. Just boom, yeah. boom, boom. This is a real tough one. Yeah. Even semi professionals like us need to take some time to answer questions. Yeah. All right. Especially riot questions. <laughs> All right. Let's, let's, <laughs> let's move on. All right. Something Fly, right? <laughs> the Tupac biopic just got done filming a few mm. weeks ago. Are you guys looking forward to seeing it? Yes. Who's directing it? I do not know. Because I and it's and it's the same actor that played Tupac in um, Shadow of Compton, I believe. Yes. Uh, we're taking a look right now. We have yeah. our best five guys on it. If I it is the same team that yeah. d- was behind making Straight Out of Compton, which I found incredibly enjoyable, and right. I was glad to see the the tale of N.W.A. done on screen. I'd love to see this version. I mean, they've done a few different versions of Tupac and Biggie so far, but I'd like to see this version. Yeah, me too. Uh, it, yeah, I think that was. I think it got kind of fast greenlit after. Yeah. Straight out of Compton, so I'm with you. If it's the same team, I know it's not F. Gary Gray that's right. directing it, but if it's the same team, then I definitely want to see what's going to happen. No, it there. appears to be Benny Boom is the director of it. Okay. I believe the movie is called All Eyes on Me. Yeah, who's, um, the, same, who's the actor? They have uh, the actor playing Mr. Shakur is not Lauren Cohen, but she is from The Walking Dead, and she will be in the movie. So um, uh, oh, we're looking for Tupac, Demetrius Ship Jr. Oh. So I think that was the same guy. Was it? In, uh, yeah, but oh. um, it's it's something to. Uh, Definitely to look forward to, although he is not listed on IMDb okay. as having a credit in Straight Outta Compton, so yeah. I don't know, but uh, sounds oh. like a sounds like a good choice to me. All right. What's next? Awesome Sauce writes, how would you guys feel about a Ghostbusters Jump Street crossover instead of Men in Black? Stay awesome. I think Ghostbusters and Men in Black makes more sense. Right. Uh, Ghostbusters Men in Black makes more sense. Awesome sauce. By the way, what's up, bud? Yeah. Thanks for coming to the show in Houston. I would I would more sign off because Ghostbusters has so much to lose right now yeah. that if you put it into a Jump Street universe and it didn't work, then it ruins Ghostbusters. <clears throat> like, in my opinion, Men in Black is already pretty much ashes. Totally. So if you put it in Jump Street and it doesn't work, well, okay, what, what do we lose? Just go back to more Jump Streets. But if you put Ghostbusters in Jump Street and it doesn't work, it's like, where does the Ghostbusters franchise go from there? Now, maybe this new Ghostbusters movie, everybody just universally pans it, and it's so bad that we have nothing else to do. At that point, maybe you try to reboot it through another successful franchise. I don't think that's the play right now. Though Men in Black and Ghostbusters is kind of... It, let's say Men in Black is successful right. in the new Jump Street movie. We like that element. Maybe someday down the road, you do get Ghostbusters and Men in Black together. That is an exciting prospect, like years down the line. I would much rather have that now because I think that you're you're risking tainting uh, 21 and 22 Jump Street with uh, the rated R. I think you, if you take away the rated R for it, it's just a different movie completely. And Lord Miller not coming back in general is, is scary to me 
for that franchise. So I think that if you take a Men in Black and a, and a Ghostbusters, which, like you said, Men in Black is kind of on the way, on its way out, and Ghostbusters hasn't been proven, you try to m put them together and see what they can do because it would make it would make a lot more sense for those guys to be investigating ghosts and then the the new Ghostbusters kind of teaming up with them. That that just makes a lot more sense as far as the whole world goes. As where in twenty one twenty Jump Street you start adding these kind of aliens and the supernatural stuff. It it just and again taking away that rated R for me really scares it. Well, I think I mean they're making MIB twenty three, so that's happening. Yeah, I know. So I, I hate that. I think I mean I'm into it because I agree with you. Men in Black three was horrible, mm -hmm. and they destroyed the franchise. Nobody cared after that movie came out. They're like, I don't care if you ever make another MIB whatever. It doesn't matter. But this is going to refresh it because they need to have something that like like 21 and 22 Jump Street which were really funny and it works with those two characters having them be the new men in black all of a sudden gives new blood to that men in black franchise then they could actually do another mashup with Ghostbusters and Men in Black later and that would make even more sense because Ghostbusters I think is going to be a big hit it's going to be a sleeper hit a lot of people are complaining about it but I think when it comes out it's it's going to prove everyone wrong in a certain way and it's going to be a smash hit then Men in Black, MIB 23 is also going to be hit. So I think combining those two might be a really good move. And again, if Jump Street, if it doesn't work with Men in Black 23, then Jump Street, all they have to do is be like, all right, well, sorry, let's just go spoof it and make another R-rated 24 Jump Street. Totally. The Channing, Channing Tatum and Jonah Hill's chemistry is going to work great, whether it's an R-rated comedy or a PG-13 comedy. Totally. Maybe you can't drop as many F-bombs or show as many boobs. I think there's a lot of ways around that, especially if you're exploring the lore of the Men in Black, where you don't have to just have this crazy adventure you know, on South Beach or wherever they right. would have gone in 23. The reason why I don't like Ghostbusters and Men in Black right now is because it would have looked desperate for Ghostbusters to be like, we're rebooting, but we also need Men in Black with us. Down the road, right. maybe it makes sense, but right now, Ghostbusters needs to be a movie that stands on its, it's own prove merits itself, before right. it comes back. And it can't have a, like a, another a dead franchise attached to it. Because yeah. that's right, what Men right. in Black is. It's a damaged franchise. Uh, before we move on, Bizkind in the chat room is asking about the Schmodown. Well, we have John Roca against Josh McCoy. Cougar. They are going up against one another. A lot of smack talk that has been happening. If John Roca wins, it sets up a Mance rematch. We'll see if that goes down. And Makuga trying to come off that loss and battling for the TV talk spot. Makuga's really. no slouch either. Like, I make fun of the guy yeah. a lot because he just seems to stumble his way into winning Schmodown mm -hmm. matches, but he has proven himself at least he is not a tomato can. Right. And Roca's a guy who sometimes, like, 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 I don't want to bring up the, the planet that shall not be named again, okay? Bespin? But, but Roca, Were you going to mention <laughs> Bes Bespin? I, I, neither it's a gas here nor planet. there, but it's, it rhymes with with a test spin. Sometimes, if he gets in front of the mic and the lights are on him and he doesn't recall that trivia sure. question, I know that every ounce of info that is in Josh McCuga's head will come out during the Schmodown. I can't say the same thing about Roca, but I would put my money on Roca. Uh, thanks again, Bizkind. All right, what's next? What was his name? Bespin? Bizkind. Oh, Bizkind. Bespin. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Giggle Skull <laughs> writes, would you like to see Julie Andrews make a cameo in the new Mary Poppins film? Yes, absolutely. Anybody else? As, as Mary Poppins' grandma, how are yeah. they going to fit her? Right. And no, I don't I don't want to see me. I think Julie Andrews has done enough. She's awesome. Let her just hang out and watch the movie. What if she just like... like uh, Unless she wants to be in it. That's what I would Emily say. Emily Blunt is like, okay, kids, a fork, a fork full of sugar helps the medicine. <laughs> Julie's like, it's a spoonful, you idiot. It's a spoonful. Right. A little tiny version of her is inside the sugar cup. That would be cool. All right, what's next? Oh, my gosh. All right, Cole Fisher writes, what video game do you think would make a good R-rated adaptation? Ooh. If they ever were able to redo Max Payne, but they just really totally. Oh, but they man. ruined it. They ruined it. Max Payne up. was such a and still such. The Max Payne three was incredible. Went to Brazil. Yeah, yeah. It was madness. I, I still would like to see Uncharted as rated R, but they wouldn't do it. They'd probably do a PG thirteen. I, I think it would make sense too for Uncharted, right. like a movie that has to be rated R. I, like Mortal Kombat, you could totally yes, go. We talked R about that the other. Oh, you with that. that? I don't know if you're on the show. I don't get invited yeah, yeah. to a lot of events, and Sorry. I go to Disney by myself. Grand but, um, Theft Auto would be a totally rate. I because you're running over people on the streets, <laughs> just like I would have to. You know, there would have to be madness involved in that game. It's, so. If Five Nights at Freddy's is that going to be rated it's, R? That sounds like something that should yeah, be rated it R. Sounds so like it. Maybe you know what? I don't. Think it'll be rated R because so many kids love that. So I think they're going to make it PG thirteen. Really? Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. Uh, all right. Let's take uh, three more. All right. Patrick Starr writes, "What movie can you not watch alone?" Ooh, good one. <sighs> Man, I, I don't. 
Thank you. Uh, so later on today, I see The Conjuring 2 with this gentleman sitting to my left. And I the first Conjuring is a movie that I wasn't necessarily crazy about going back to my, at the time, apartment by myself and going to bed. The one that really freaked me out was forever, whatever, people like to call this a horror comedy, Drag Me to Hell was scary as crap, man. That was a hard movie to go to sleep after. And uh, The Exorcist is always way up there for me. And Paranormal Activity, all of the paranormal activities make me feel creepy when I'm alone. And, I, and I'm on the road a lot, so I go to hotels. So The Shining is always something with me. I can't remember the name of the hotel room in The Shining, like 239, whatever it is. Oh, but sure. I always hope I don't get that You don't want to go in that room. I don't remember that I got you that number. Go. See, I think it's 237. I don't have I was so one. close. I don't have one. What are you talking You're about? You're so tough. No, it's not You're that. So it's tough. not that. I don't know if I have one like to where I have to. I need someone that'll in the creep room. you out. Yeah, you know what? Uh, I'm not saying I don't get creeped out by movies, but I can do it if I'm I, there by myself. I'm a weirdo. I like getting creeped out. I like yeah, having nightmares, so I like watching movies that freak me out alone because I can just fully concentrate and get creeped out. Oh, by I enjoy them. watching them yeah, alone, but right. it's like, is it going to have an effect well, on yeah. you more so than with other people? There, like, sure. So sure. The Conjuring is one of the films that I loved when it came out because it actually creeped me out, and I like getting scared. Some movies. That don't scare me. I don't want to go into those, but that one really, really worked. So I cannot wait to see the Conjuring. Too. And uh, uh, comedies I like watching with people. Yes, like, like I like watching with a lot of people because we all get to laugh together. You feel like a weirdo laughing in your place. Let by me yourself. mention the Witch. If you haven't seen the Witch, it's, it's still playing in a yeah. few select theaters. But check it out. It's also on VOD now. But see that movie in the theater if you can. There's some creepy moments to it, and it's like there's a lot of it's very just like atmospheric. There's not a lot of you know musical score. It's not a big movie, but it just slowly ratchets up. It slowly mm -hmm. gets creepier and creepier. And by the time you meet Black Phillip, ooh. Well, speaking of horror and speaking of thrills, we uh, <laughs> announced yesterday on Movie Talk that we have a brand new show coming at you guys, and that is Collider Nightmares. Yeah. It's going to be. Mm. Run by the lovely Clark Wolf. Going to have Perry Nemiroff on it. Mr. Schnepp's going to be on there. Mark Riley's going to be on there. It's going to be covering all the stuff happening in the world of horror, some brand new things, some thrillers. It's going to be a lot of fun, and that is going to be starting up pretty soon. Uh, next Tuesday. Next Tuesday. Yeah. So make sure you check that out. And another thing, right after this, myself, Ellis, Schnepp, and I'm going to make MOBA do it. We're going to do the Facebook Live right after the movie talk right now. Come on over. So all the slappies who are online right now watching this, can they, they can get do on it. Facebook? All they need to Come do on. is go over to let's Collider.com on Facebook. Megatron. We're going to do a Q&A. Ask whatever you want. Go on over there and check it out. Let's do two more questions from the Twitter sphere, and then all we'll right. sign off and do Facebook. Rob Cartel writes, if you were to play a Disney animated character, who would you prefer to be? The Beast. I want to be Donald Duck. Nice. <laughs> what you got? Good. Uh, I'm thinking one of the. I'm thinking one of the dwarfs. Nice. Was there? I, usually it'd be Which grumpy, one? but like or. Oh, sneezy. name all seven of them, you ball bags. <laughs> I'll try. Right really, now. these guys making me name all seven. First when of all, I, that was a really fight tough Jim question. Sock, the next time I'm on Schmoes, don't screw me so bad. Anybody okay, could name right all now. seven dwarves. Dopey, what? Sleazy, happy, sleazy. grumpy, dog. <laughs> sneezy, sorry. That's sleazy. You sleazy. said sleazy. Creepy. You Alice said, is already wrong. You said sandwiches or scrambled eggs. <laughs> I said <laughs> eggs and then F you and oh, yeah, a couple yeah, other yeah. dwarves that are not to be named. All right, last Papa one. Smurf, that was because I was like, thanks for <laughs> screwing me on this one, guys. <laughs> last one. All right. Curious George writes, best movie marathon you've ever done. Uh, ooh, you know, I'll just call back to me and Dennis and Campia went and saw the seventh sun and Jupiter, yeah. whatever the hell it was, Jupiter rising, ascending, descending, yeah. whatever the hell it was. Starring scrambled eggs. Yes. Yeah. That was a lot of fun. It was two bad more. films, so that was really fun. I, uh, when I was a kid, uh, we did a double feature where the kids went to go see Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. And the parents went to go see uh, the Dead Poets Society. And then we met in the next theater afterwards, and we both saw Ghostbusters. We all saw Ghostbusters 2 together. That was a pretty good day. 2009, Inglorious Bastards and District 9. That was an incredible double Whoa, feature. Oh, yeah. Uh, it wasn't a great one, but I saw all three Matrix somewhere, and, I, and that was And your head didn't explode? Great. Yeah, it wasn't great. Um, all Ooh. right, la we'll do one more now. Okay, Goon78 <laughs> writes... Where's Goon77? <laughs> Which is better, Civil War or The Force Awakens? It's a great it's question, but... It's an uh, overall movie. I mean, look, as a fan, I can probably watch... I'll be watching Force Awakens over and over, but I think as an overall movie for what they did, I'd have to say Civil War. 
as far I, as put together, I mean, the movie, what the Russo brothers did with it, and they had to add some new things to it. And I, I'm okay with it, but I fully acknowledge that The Force Awakens was an homage to Episode Four. It had a lot of repeat things. They played it a bit safe, which is okay, and I understand yeah. that it sets the sets it into motions. But I think as an overall movie, by slight edge, I give it a Civil War. I'd have to agree, but I mean, I think that they're in literally both different such different universes yeah. that i don't even compare movies like that anymore it's like you know there's different genres that i'll compare and those that i think that's more fair than to say what's well, the best movie ever it's like you know there's so many amazing films that i can't ever say there's one of the best films ever. i think people are sleeping on what a great film force awakens was i mean everybody you know we had a lot of fun it's great to see these these old characters these new ones really came to play but the pressure that force awakens had on it is, is far exceeds anything that civil war had to do and civil war had some pressure on it because yeah. you had to make me believe these superheroes really want to fight each other but force awakens coming out reinvigorating the biggest greatest franchise of all time back into theaters that was such a huge bar to overpass and it did it magnificently so so i will say force awakens all right well there you go thank you for sending in those tweets and that is today's episode of movie talk i would like to thank the panel today first mr john schnepp where can they find you you guys can find me on twitter and facebook uh, sorry twitter and instagram at uh, john schnepp and i'll be at the phoenix comic-con this weekend so come on by friday saturday and sunday i'll be sweating it out i guess it's 115 degrees let's sweat it out in phoenix all right, sitting next to me, Mark Ellis, where can they find you? Oh, yeah, you think you're cool going to Phoenix? I'll be in Cincinnati this what? weekend, Friday and Saturday at the Funny Bone there. Next weekend at Laugh Boston in Beantown. You can find me online at Mark Ellis Live. And with this gentleman on our YouTube channel, Schmoes No. Ms. Ashley Mova, where can they find you? You think you're cool in Cincinnati? Well, I'll uh. be in Los Angeles this weekend. You can uh. see me on Twitter and Instagram at Ashley Mova. Happy Wednesday, guys. And for me, I will be here checking my Twitter at Christian Harloff at, and also Instagram. <laughs> and if we were talking about it before, please go and check out the Silly Arnold video that's on the Schmoes No channel right it now. It's so funny. You give them a little trailer. Like, uh, I, don't, little I don't know. Preview. I want to see it. I want to go see it. In a world where <laughs> elephants attack yeah. chiefs. There, there he goes. He's going. What's he doing? He's stepping forward. Um, so go oh, go and check that out, please. And, and let me you know. see a foot. <laughs> yeah. And then it's like cut. Yeah. It's a crazy that's video all. in general. Yeah. Where's so he going now? Let me know that you're over from Collider Movie Talk. And obviously we mentioned at the Schmodown. It's a big match between Roka and Makuga. And we are doing Facebook Live in about two to five minutes right after this. Go over to Facebook. Join Collider.com and you'll see the video. Get your questions in there. Have a conversation with the four of us. We will be doing it soon. At Cloud City, uh, best bit. <laughs> hey guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.